Welcome back, everyone. This is the last talk on iOS stage. Uh, we'll be uh, hosting another great speaker, and he loves teaching, sharing. Uh, he loves to share knowledge, and also speaking at conferences. His talk will be about Swift UI in production. And please welcome Peter Steinberger. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. Glad to be able to talk a little bit about our um, road to get Swift UI into our product. And also looking forward to the Q&A. Um, I, know, I know this is a pretty hot topic, so I'm sure there will be some questions. All right. Should we start with the presentation? Let's get going. All right, so let's talk about Swift UI production. Um, right now, and I'm talking May 2021, Swift UI is in this uncomfortable position where it does show us a radically different way of building UI, but it's also so new that it's it's risky to use, right? So if I'm looking at my Twitter, I see people praising it and I see people cursing it. And there's great small examples where it's amazing. And then on the other side, you hear random attribute graph errors and uh, all the things that are exploding and missing from Swift UI. So we wanted to know, can we use it? Should you? Uh, and we identified a feature in our product that seems really well suited for being built in Swift UI, while we also still support iOS 12. And here's what we learned. So a little bit about me. My name is Peter Steinberger. I come from Vienna, Austria. I do iOS since, I would say, the dawn of time, back when there was still viewed it unload. Uh, and I do love working on difficult problems. So this definitely hit all my spots. Uh, on Twitter, I talk a lot about iOS topics, about running a business. And lately, of course, especially also Swift UI. So you can follow me on the Stipeet and learn all the highs and lows of this road. I also work at PSPDF Kit, the company I founded in 2011. We're a small uh, distributed company. I would say we have, we have remote before it was cool. And we offer a product to show, annotate, and sign documents, mostly PDF, but also office and image files. Um, you can display them, annotate them, fill forms, digitally sign, merge, flatten, uh, and much more. It's also available on all the platforms. And you'll, we'll come back to the signing part. Um, I've been very critical towards Swift UI in the beginning, I would say for a good year. But then I heard more and more reports that it actually does work out for some people. So I really wanted to give it a go. Um, I bought a quite a f infamous <laughs> uh, post called The State of Swift UI, where I really take apart Apple's Fruta example project. So for, for those of you who haven't seen it, Fruta is a Swift UI multi platform app. So it's native, each with AppKit and UIKit. And it doesn't use Catalyst there, so it's uh, it's a good citizen, you could say. The AppKit bindings for Swift UI specifically have been rough. So if you used it a little bit, and you can see like my mouse uh, on this sort of screen, uh, there's all kind of weird bugs, and it takes about a minute to actually get it to crash. I would say I'm monkey clicking because I'm like clicking faster than the usual uh, person would expect or test. But really, this one in the beginning was far too easy to break. Um, and you see that it's already stopping. And you see a crash uh, with one of the bindings. I think this one goes up to the toolbar and uh, <clears throat> a parameter not satisfying. So that's just a bug in, in how the Swift UI mappings go to AppKit. The good part is that if you're just building iOS apps, you're far better off because um, there's far fewer problems in, in the iOS bindings than in the AppKit bindings. Now, what I personally did and what I can recommend you also do is um, maybe find something that's like not very critical and start introducing Swift UI there. So um, we have a customer app. It's called PDF Viewer. Uh, it, it, you can kind of guess what, what it does based on the name. And what we had there, we have an iOS version and also a Catalyst version. And to really get up to speed and try Swift UI out in a very small piece, I had a goal of just rewriting the, the settings dialog. So what I did first was I completely rewrote it to look the same way. This is like the, 
the left side, uh, which really feels out of place on, on Mac OS. But the first step really was just make it functionally comparable. And then a few days, I took it from this catalyst mass you see on the left side to this actually native looking control on the right side. Uh, and this is really where the power of Swift here shines. You can do so much uh, sophisticated layout uh, with uh, very little code. And you can also like do it live with the editor. So once we shipped that and we saw that it actually works, we, we went on and introduced a larger feature. Um, and luckily, this was around the time where we decided that we want to redo electronic signatures. So of course, we had signature support for, I would say, the dawn of time in our product that's kind of core, uh, one of the core features you want to do in a PDF, you want to sign it. But so far, we only allowed drawing a signature. And our customers also wanted more. They wanted to use an existing image or something that you know from uh, industry, just like DocuSign, uh, to actually type the, the signature and then have something that, that, that looks really good. So we completely redesigned the dialogue. And what we also did for OS compatibility is that if you use iOS 12, we kept the existing dialogue with not as many features, but still working. Uh, so that's how we could use Swift UI on iOS 13 and 14, but still have at least the existing functionality there on iOS 12. Um, if you watch my talk, I probably don't need to say so much about the benefits of Swift UI. <laughs> um, UI creation is much simpler. Updates are much easier to do. But you, you'll find it out when you try it. Um, the good part about Swift UI is also that it can be really well mixed with existing code. So I'm only going over that uh, very roughly. A, a lot of our framework is still in Objective-C. We, we started in 2011, and really, we couldn't move to Swift UI before version 5 uh, because binary compatibility took a while to get there. So we can really snap with our finger and rewrite everything in Swift. And I'm sure some of you are in the same position. But the beauty is, is that Swift UI you can use in Swift. You can even, even use in Objective-C. UI hosting controller works on both ends. Uh, for this component, we handle presentation in UIKit. So the whole thing is a UI hosting controller, and everything in there is Swift UI. So it's a really great example of like having somewhat an, an isolated feature. Now, let's get a little bit to the challenge of Swift UI. The problem here is that we still support iOS 12. We're going to drop that soon in, in anticipation of iOS 15. But we still have to support iOS 13. And this was what I call Swift UI 1 in this talk, where iOS 14 and the big Sur release is Swift UI 2. And in probably about a week, we will see a preview of Swift UI 3. So the real challenge here is that supporting Swift UI 1 has its challenges. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind when I show you a few of those hacks um, to work on issues is that Swift UI 1 is kind of like a done thing. Even if you consider this uh, the workaround we have kind of dirty, or you use view introspection, or any of the other things I introduce, know that Swift UI 1 is kind of like done. It will not change anymore. So if you require a hack that only needs to work on the Swift UI 1 version, only on iOS 13, and you not ship it on future versions, you are pretty much in the safe because you can test this on all the conditions, um, even though something like that you wouldn't be able or comfortable to ship on an open-ended version. So let's start with something that looks simple but really isn't. Uh, when we have a signature screen in landscape, we use a popover to show the font picker. Now in Swift UI, popovers are always presented as sheets in compact size class environments. So with adaptive presentation style, it is possible to show popovers even on iPhone. We are returning none in the delegate. However, the problem is that there is no real equivalent for that in Swift UI. It is possible to completely rebuild popovers in Swift UI, doing all the shadows, doing the arrow, but getting all those details right isn't trivial, and it really seems much more work than just using the existing UI framework logic. So to mix and match those two worlds, we need a few tricks. 
Presenting popovers in UIKit need a source view where they can anchor on, uh, coordinates where exactly the error should be, and also a view controller to present. We have nothing like that in SwiftUI by default. However, the beauty is that SwiftUI can be mixed so nicely with UIKit. If we embed a UIKit view into the SwiftUI hierarchy, we can access that. We both get the view that we can use to anchor, and we can also get the view controller from there. So what I did is I wrote a small helper class that, that we call anchor button. And on tap, it passes on the view that it embeds, and we can use that view to show our font list controller. Now, the font list controller offers a, a convenient present method to present itself on a view. This is fairly straightforward logic, uh, as you know from UIKit. Since you need a view control to present, we have a helper here, and you see it uh, with the underscore. It's called PSPDF underscore closest view controller. So what we do here is we take the view and we crawl up the responder chain. We are calling next responder and checking for the class until we find the nearest view controller. Now, this might feel dirty to you, but the responder chain is documented to include views and view controllers. So you can rely on it. It is safe to do. And even Apple does this sometimes internally in UIKit. Now, the remaining logic is in viewed load where we simply add the signature font list UI view via hosting controller again. So here we use a, a quick helper to do the auto layout constraints and the, the child view controller relationship. You probably have your own helpers if you do this for a little bit. Again, this um, mostly trivial work. Uh, one, one detail here is that we pass a closure that calls dismiss on the controller. That's an optimization. Uh, because we have some finicky details where we allow touches to tap through in some of the parts of the view controller. So we also need a way to dismiss it programmatically. Now, however, if there is enough space, uh, consider an iPad or, or a Mac Catalyst version of this, we don't need the popover. And we can use the signature font list in SwiftUI directly. So we're going to save a lot of logic there. Now, currently, these are quite a few moving parts. Um, and we haven't made it generic yet, but it's pretty easy to make this system reusable and offer in different parts of your code base. What we usually do is we apply Yagni, uh, you ain't gonna need it, and we will refactor this as needed. Another benefit is that we are using this approach. We work around the bug where having different popover view modifiers in SwiftUI doesn't work reliable until iOS 14.5. Now, let's get back to the anchor button. It's by far not as tricky as you might imagine by me talking about it. Internally, the structure wraps a regular button, and it adds this wrap UI view behind the button via a C stack. I could probably also have used a, a background view modifier to do the same. Um, there's really no difference, whatever you prefer. What we do is we keep track of the UI view and pass it as a parameter on the closure that is called when the button is pressed. And really, that's already everything that's to it. Um, I'm linking the, the presentation later on, so you can also get the gist and feel free to use this whenever you need. Now, let's talk about toolbars in SwiftUI. There's a big difference because in, in SwiftUI 2, we have this new toolbar modifier that greatly improves how toolbars can be added. The new API gets a lot of details right. So it's just making the done button confirmation bold and really matching or extending uh, the UIKit experience. On iOS 13, there is navigation by items leading and trailing. However, there's no simple API to actually center elements in the toolbar, which is what we do in landscape orientation for compact size classes. Now, what we do here is we use the amazing Swift UIX project as a temporary bridge to get similar functionality. It, uh, the person who wrote it already built a, a version of navigation by items that takes a leading, a center, and a trailing parameter. We'll drop this code once we can drop iOS 13 in probably a year, uh, and we'll just keep the simpler, more modern solution. So if you look at the screenshot here, we already printed the work to write it twice. 
Um, so then in anticipation of the future, we can simply delete the else block and have clean code. Now, you could argue that uh, I could have a simple solution or not write the, the, the code twice here. But the Toolbar API is a little bit tricky insofar because you need to use an add availability, um, which doesn't directly work in post-fix expressions. You will, you will see this restriction uh, quite soon when you actually try SwiftUI. Now, the good thing is that this is a temporary problem and the SwiftUI language team is working on this already. There's a proposal called SE. 308, where you see um, how you can use this if and end if blocks now in post fixed member expressions pretty soon. Um, if you're lucky, we already get this in a good week. Now, let's talk about another problem and something every SwiftUI developer's worst nightmare, I would say attribute graph precondition failures. Usually, when you get a crash like this, there are no symbols of your own code, and working around is quite difficult. And I'm honest, my strategy to change things and uh, to fix this problem is usually you change things randomly and you pray until things start working again. Luckily, this doesn't happen a lot. We found uh, one such crash in our Mac Catalyst version, but only on, on Catalina. And one pattern I saw where usually there are problems, especially in SwiftUI 1, is when you have nested geometry readers. Now, this is, will not be a solution for every problem. Um, but what we saw in production is that before iOS 14.2, nesting geometry readers is often problematic. So in this particular case, there's actually no reason why we need two geometry readers other than like us not really understanding SwiftUI and just trying things out. So we would be able to, to change the layered logic to really just use one and use a little bit of mass on our own. But for this particular fix, I actually opted to just not call the inner metrics version in Catalyst. The, the benefit of Catalyst is that there's no compact size classes. So we can actually simplify our logic. And just by not calling the inner metrics, we could work around the crash. So whenever you see a crash, look at your geometry readers. That's always a hot guess. Now, another um, problem you should be aware of is observable object on iOS 13 doesn't work if you use NS object as a class parent. Um, in most cases, you probably won't need that. But if you still require Objective-C compatibility with your API, you should be aware However, it's quite easy to simply call object will change manually. Um, and that ultimately is exactly the same was the automatic inference work would do for you. Now, uh, I know there's quite a lot of examples and I'm, I'm going through, but we have time for QA in a little bit. One common complaint in the Swift UI can do this category is setting the first responder. When the user select type in our, in our dialogue here, we want to automatically show the software keyboard because you were just about to go into type. And like having to type again on it would not be a good experience. And while folks are correct that there is a currently no API in Swift UI that does it, it does something that is very easy to work around. My guess is that this is an area where we see an improvement in WWC in a year. Um, so how do you do that? You can actually access the inner UI text view, text field that Swiftier uses with a custom view modifier. Now, once that one is resolved, we can simply call become first responder on that view. As an added benefit, getting access to the internally used UI text view enables us to set a custom return key type, which also is API that's currently missing from SwiftUI. Now, the logic is. A little bit tricky, there is a, a text field finder that uses a UV subclass. You overwrite did move to window, and then you search for the UI text field in the hierarchy. Uh, of course, this is undocumented behavior. There's no guarantee that Swift UI uses um, UI text field in SwiftUI version 3. It could be replaced by a custom control that's not exposed or 
or maybe you don't know, right? But right now this works. So in this case, we decided that it's worth the risk. Um, the code is written in a way that worst case, we don't find the text field. That means the user has to tap in one more time. So it's a, a, a slight regression. Um, depending on, on your needs uh, and goals, this might be something that you need, um, that you really need to depend on. So in that case, you can always wrap your own UI text view and just wrap all the things that you need in Swift UI. So therefore, you can be sure that you always have the text view and the functionality will be the same. Now, I also really rushed over the how you actually do the inspection because there is already a Swift UI library. It's called Swift UI Introspect that does all that for you. Uh, also, a long list of other controls. Uh, I think there's a pull request open for me to do the same for um, and a split view because I'm, I'm working a little bit on the Mac as well. So this is mostly a solved problem, and it's I would say it's almost a, necess a necessary evil currently to ship really good Swift UI projects. Now, um, in terms of bugs, there's another one that was a little bit tricky to find, but ultimately very easy to resolve. So we noticed that sometimes the UI would just freeze, where there's an infinite layout loop. When you entered text and then started deleting the text, and you've been deleting the last character. And Swift UI 1, for whatever reason, this caused an, an infinite layout cycle. So what we did here is we, we identified the issue. We wrote a safe category, safe minimum scale factor, that simply doesn't do anything on iOS 13. The UI is still good enough. I would say this is a small degradation, but it's very livable. And on iOS 14 and above, uh, we use the scale factor, and the problem was gone. Now, in my talk, you see me wrap custom views quite a bit. Most of the time, it's the same code. And we can write a small helper that makes this much more simple. So in this case, you see that I have a wrap view helper that wraps, in this case, a drawing view. And then in the I get a block where I can actually configure the draw view. And the beauty is that everything is still reactive. If, if selected color on my model changes, the view is rebuilt, and I have the same benefits from Swift UI, but I can reuse parts of my existing UI code. Um, Rep view is also quite a straightforward struct, uh, generic one, of course. And we expose both creation and, and an update block, so it's easy to configure the view after it's being created. And now the last one before we move on to QA, and also the most tricky part, is keyboard avoidance. So. Swift UI in version 2 has really great automatic keyboard avoidance built right in. This feature doesn't exist at all in Swift UI 1. So we had to retrofit it. Um, you see the signature view here? And I'll, I'll maybe start the, the play once again. The, the whole control moves up, but then also the, 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 the bottom toolbar moves up so it stays in view. Now, how would you do that in Swift UI? We we have a we start with a keyboard view that again wraps an existing UI view and has one binding to communicate the intersection keyboard haze. The actual logic happens in the view code coordinator. You see that in the next slide. So the coordinator is a class, and not a struct. So Swift UI will keep that alive as long as your web view is displayed. What we do there is we listen to the keyboard will change frame notification. We get the keyboard react. We convert it to the hosting controller. And then we calculate the intersection height. This is a little bit gnarly code. Uh, if you do, did keyboard, you probably know that already. Keyboard code is a little bit tricky. But we always we, we also deal with situations where the keyboard is not docked. So um, it has to be that way. Now, since we use a form sheet to present the, the signature view, this one already has keyboard avoidance built in and moves up. So in order to have our calculation where we then modify the view within, we use a quite cheap trick where we just do everything and run loop later. So UIKit already did the moving up for us. And then we calculate the remaining intersection width that we need to do. Now. 
This one is a little bit tricky, and we didn't want to rely on differences iOS 13 and iOS 14. So we have a, a wrapper that simply disables the keyboard avoidance that's built in in iOS 14. Once we drop iOS 13, we can likely remove a lot of code and re-enable that. But since it's quite gnarly and sh really should work, um, we didn't want to build two versions and just want to rely on our logic here. OK, and to wrap this up, here's how the keyboard view is used. Um, you see that it's like we have the text view, we have the font list, we have the bottom toolbar. And right at the bottom, we have the keyboard view that starts with basically having no hate. And it gets hate when the keyboard is visible. So everything everything moves up in Swift UI. All right, uh, I went through quite a lot. I think I'm five minutes over time. Uh, we did talk about the state of Swift UI, mixing it with existing code, about presenting popovers, uh, about toolbar logic, about uh, popular crashes, and making sure you look at your geometry readers, about wrapping views, and about first responder settings. And with that, I say I'll see you in a few minutes in the 3D world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for your talk. And everyone, I encourage you to go and find him in the 3D world to ask him further questions. And uh, <laughs> just enjoy his company in our awesome uh, 3D world. Uh, I would like to give some shout outs to our partners and the awesome people without whom we wouldn't have this amazing conference. And those are Conferomatic, JetBrains, Kiwi, MSD, and Smartlook. And on iOS stage, this was the last talk, but uh, we will continue at 5 p.m. with the lightning talks. So uh, come back and on both of the stages, you'll have lightning talks. They're the same, they will be shared. And enjoy the rest of your uh, conference in the 3D world. Enjoy your quests. If you haven't finished them yet, you still have some time. Uh, find your other speakers and fi find your other friends and co-workers and engage and just enjoy as much as you can. And it was lovely to have you here and I'll see you at the lightning talks and just let's have a party in the 3D world. Thank you so much and enjoy.